This content is brought to you by Uphold, which is a great platform that makes it easy and simple for you to buy, hold, and sell and earn crypto. You can trade from anything to anything. For example, you can trade between cryptocurrencies and precious metals. It's an amazing platform that I've been using for years. And in fact, I still use to this day because they're one, a great exchange, um, they're reputable, and they're one of the only exchanges that still lists XRP. Many of the other exchanges have delisted XRP due to the SEC lawsuit, but you can still get XRP on Uphold. So I have interviewed the CEO, the founder, and many other representatives from Uphold over the years. And I'm a fan of this platform. And once again, there's some great features like trading between different assets very easily. You don't have to convert to a currency and so forth. They're used by 10 plus million users. They have over 200 cryptocurrencies and they have a very easy to use app. Uh, the interface is really nice. So I can certainly vouch for this platform. Once again, I've been a user for years. So if you'd like to learn more about Uphold, please visit the link in the description. Welcome back to the Thinking Crypto Podcast, your home for cryptocurrency news and interviews. With me today is J.W. Verrett, who's the Associate Professor of Law at George Mason University, a consultant at Veritas Financial Analytics, and a former SEC Advisory Committee member. JW, great to have you back on the show. Thanks, Tony. Thanks for having me, man. Uh, JW, you've been doing a lot, uh, you know, on the regulatory front, fighting for crypto, and uh, certainly want to talk to you about the different initiatives you're working on. So the first item I wanted to cover was uh, the Zcash Foundation, your candidacy for the Zcash Foundation. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, the Zcash Foundation just opened up a call for nominations and... Um, <clears throat> Well, uh, somebody in the community was nice enough to nominate me for a, a seat on an open seat on the board. Uh, Zcash is a project I really care about, and this is uh, this is a volunteer position, but it's one that I put my name in the hat for. Um, I, I care a lot about Zcash and the future of Zcash. Uh, they built something really special in that protocol, and it's something that I use to the extent that you can you you know you can use it. Um, I'd love to to help the community grow adoption, grow usability, scalability. Um, it's a terrific, uh, it's also a terrific just governance design. Uh, the the uh, Zcash blockchain has a development fund that kicks off of, of mining rewards mm -hmm. and puts them into the Zcash Foundation, into the Electric Coin Company, which is run by Zuko Wilcox, our legendary founder of Zcash, one of the founders of Zcash. And also to a, something called the Zcash Grants uh, program. Uh, so yeah, I, I hope for the opportunity to serve in that way or in some other way to, to help Zcash because I think the future of crypto is private and I think the world still has to kind of learn that. Uh, and Zcash is, the, is, is a great project in that space. Yeah, absolutely. And my next question was going to be the privacy. Um, I absolutely agree with you that privacy is going to be important, especially in a world of CBDCs that are coming which are not going to be private, uh, and the government can monitor everything you're doing. But on that note, you know, do you feel the government's going to make a big push to try to stop privacy coins such as Zcash? If if um, if the technology is built correctly, mm. it will be very hard for them to do that, just as a technical matter. And I think Zcash has always been building toward that. They've always done a good job of doing that. Um, secondly, just from a legal perspective, it will be and it should be hard for the government to do that. I mean, we have a test case now in the government's attack on privacy in their sanction of the Tornado Cash smart contract code. Yeah. I have um, I have a lot of hope for the Coinbase employees lawsuit or Coin Center's lawsuit that was just announced this week. I'm very excited about it. It's a terrific uh, piece of work there. So I think even in that test case, the government's odds are not very good. It would be a lot harder for the government to try to sanction something like Bitcoin Whirlpool and then to sanction something like Monero or Zcash would be even much more difficult uh, than that, just from a legal perspective. So hopefully the tech is uncensorable tech if we're doing it right, decentralized, uncensorable. But just from a legal and constitutional and statutory authorization perspective, hopefully there are limits on their ability to do that as well, but it is something I think about a lot, and 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 and, and you know, and, and careful to keep pay attention to, and I think in the, the design of Zcash, they've been very careful about uh, designing that community to make it 
as decentralized, as uncensorable as possible, while at the same time maintaining a core group of developers. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it certainly opened Pandora's box when U.S. Treasury went after Tornado Cash. They went after the code versus the nefarious actors, the people who did the bad things. Um, and could you elaborate a bit on, you know, what, what Coin Center and those folks are doing? Are they suing the U.S. Treasury or certain parts of the government as a result of, of this action they took? Yeah, they're suing Janet Yellen in her capacity as Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, and uh, uh, they are suing over a number of things, uh, I- including constitutional claims and including claims that OVAC has exceeded its statutory authority in sanctioning code, which I think is right. Uh, I mean, the, you know, if you read the statute and the executive orders implementing the statute, they talk about sanctioning people. They talk about sanctioning entities or groups of people. Um, that's not smart contract code. Mm. Uh, OFAC is also a number of times sanctioned, uh, added to the sanctions list, uh, particular account numbers. Uh, but those are just a proxy for, or even, even public keys, public addresses. But those are just a proxy for the individuals, the sanctioned individuals who are known to control that address. But it's a whole thing altogether to say Tornado Cash is sanctioned, which uh, we all, I think, interpret properly as Tornado Cash, the Tornado Cash smart contract code is sanctioned. Because, of course, there's no entity, there's no DAO, there's no developers, there's no nothing. Right. Uh, the admin keys were burnt. Uh, it's just a smart contract code. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, is the future or I should say the solution that the government needs to come and work with the private sector on this to figure out how do we find a balance? I understand there's concerns on the government's end, but they certainly went uh, uh, beyond their normal scope in in sanctioning the code. So, you know, are are you hearing anything of, okay, let's have a, a committee or a group and government officials in the private sector to figure these things out? Uh, no, I, I, you know, I, well, I should say in the past, mm. FinCEN, which is a different organization from OFAC, um, has a record of working with, with groups like Coin Center and listening to them and learning from them. And I think Coin Center is very pleased with some of those interactions in the past, that they were intelligent, trying to get it right. Um, and I think that I, I, I haven't interacted with OFAC or FinCEN myself, but I understand people in the community at the various trade associations for crypto and such have worked with OFAC have worked with uh FinCEN these two entities that do sanctions and that do that, that are the principal entities for AML BSA compliance but as I understand what happened this time with Coronado Cash basically the, the real experts inside the halls of treasury said we can't do this and from on high the secretary of state the white house said Look, it's a, it's North Korea. Just get them. Just do it. Mm. Uh, and and that's why I think they were pressured to exceed the boundaries of their statutory authority, which is why ultimately, because we have people like Coinbase and Coin Center brave enough to fight, right. uh, I think we're going to win. Mm. So it's kind of like they had a knee jerk reaction, right? It was North Korea. OK, it doesn't matter. We're not even going to think this one through. Just, Just kill it. Kill the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, OK. Well, you know, in a way, it's. I'm glad it's if it was to happen, you know, it was that reason and they didn't actually think it through and then came to the conclusion of, you know, we're going to sanction code. It was more of a a knee jerk reaction. Yeah. In the words of Luke Skywalker, uh, your overconfidence is your weakness. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I think think that's Treasury's problem. (laughs) For sure. Um, Now, in the larger picture of crypto regulations, um, how do you feel about what took place this year? You know, 2023 is around the corner, uh, but this year we had the executive order. We had some uh, bipartisan support for crypto, actually a bipartisan bill with Senator Lummis and Gillibrand. And there's just more members of Congress on both sides of the aisle supporting crypto now. Do you feel we've made progress? Uh, you know, sometimes I get frustrated. It's it's moving at snail's pace, but do you feel we've made progress? Tremendous progress. Mm-hmm. It just compared to where we were a year ago. Um, the and, and, and measured in terms of just the tone, the tenor of congressional hearings into crypto, you have a lot more members at committees like agriculture or financial services or banking who are interested, at least in learning, than the members that are just turned off and, oh, it must all be a scam. Let's just kill the whole industry. 
uh, those people are kind of the outliers at this mm-hmm. point. And so I think that progress is tremendous. Now, the delta between where we are now and what it would take to pass a major comprehensive crypto bill is a wide one. And I don't see that happening for a long time. Um, I think that we might make some progress with the stablecoin bill. Sure. I think we might be able to take some discrete item and put it into a so-called must-pass bill unrelated to crypto, like uh, de minimis tax for, for crypto transactions, less than 200 or 500, or let's make it as high as we can get it. But under that, uh, the use of the use of Bitcoin or any other crypto or XRP or ETH to buy something would not be treated as a taxable tra- transaction for capital gains taxes. Um, we can do those things if we fight hard, but I don't think major comprehensive legislation is likely within the next couple of years. Hmm. So you think 2023 might just be the year of the stable coin regulations, but not the comprehensive one we're looking at maybe to uh you know capture or fire on all cylinders and and you know just cover everything within crypto that's right that's right the other thing i think will be uh will be helpful is if as predicted the house of representatives flips that means that um patrick McHenry will be the new chairman of the house financial services committee uh and i'm a big fan of his i worked with him for a little bit when i was a staffer at the house financial services committee um He's he's a legend. He's very good at oversight too. Uh, I, you know, I testified in front of him. I think about twelve years ago, when I first started as a scholar in D.C. about some issues in the Dodd Frank Act, um, and then I I worked with him about five years after that as a staffer. So I've seen him in action, and he's good at what he does. And let me tell you, the subpoenas are going to fly over to Gary Gensler, so he needs to be ready for that. And hopefully that will keep some of the excesses that we've seen at the SEC in check. Yeah, interesting point you bring up because I interviewed Congressman Tom Emmer multiple times and, you know, he gave a a kind of a a famous line, (laughs) I believe a month or two ago, where he said a new day is coming and he was talking to the SEC enforcement director and, you know, kind of alluding to potentially Republicans, uh, you know, winning the midterms and then he said having the gavel, they will have the gavel in their hands to then keep regulators like Gary Gensler in check. Yeah. And, you know, there's a few things they can do. One is um, oversight, uh, subpoenas of, of emails and such. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, what we've heard is that there are staff at the SEC that are using apps like Signal and WhatsApp, like we do, to try to keep our communications private. They're doing the same thing to keep them private from congressional oversight. Now, if they're doing that from a... Uh, just government ethics and, and oversight perspective, it's illegal. Mm-hmm. Uh, so hopefully uh, in that context, I, 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 and I feel a lot more comfortable with you and me using SIG on WhatsApp sure. to maintain our privacy than I do someone in a government position who should be accountable to the public. Um, but we might see that issue uh, come up in oversight. Another thing that they can do on the Hill is to insert appropriations riders. And we've already seen Mr. McHenry uh, float an appropriations rider to limit the SEC from adopting the new rule that attacks DeFi, that would require all DeFi, all DEXs to register essentially with the with the SEC in a way that violates freedom of speech, as, as Coin Center's letter has 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 uh, made the case. Um, so we might see a lot of we'll probably see a lot of that next year. Mm. Um, JW, you support a lot of different folks within the crypto industry, companies, and so forth, and many of them you're helping to fight against the SEC. Uh, Can you tell us about the work you're doing? I I don't know how much details you can uh, disclose, but uh, you you can tell us a bit about what you're doing. Yeah, so a couple different projects. So one thing that I do is I practice as a securities lawyer Mm -hmm. um, and I'm available to help crypto clients. I'm not representing any crypto clients right now, but I'm available to help crypto clients if they if they if they need help. Um, And uh, my practice is is in is in securities and corporate governance litigation. So I'm there to help clients, even outside of crypto as well, uh, work through investigations and enforcement actions. I also am standing up a new think tank, the Crypto Freedom Lab, to get involved in a policy fight. And uh, we just had a get, GitHub round mm-hmm. and uh, continuing to, uh, to, to get the word out through the Crypto Freedom Lab. And hopefully this will be an entity that will help to bring, there are some academics 
economists and law academics and computer science academics who have some good thinking that would help inform the debate, but they're not as active in the kind of in Washington because they're busy kind of doing their thing, writing academic work. So I'd love to harness that, all that talent and knowledge and direct it into comment letters to agencies to help guide what comes out of agencies uh, and guide things like the process we saw after the Biden executive order. So um, and then do amicus briefs and maybe even get involved in some litigation through the Crypto Freedom Lab, because we don't have enough entities suing the government. I think the more the more the better uh, from that perspective and just from a rule of law perspective. Sure. Uh, so that's what the Crypto Freedom Lab is all about. And uh, yeah, I just, uh, I, you know, I love getting involved in policy debates. I love to fight for innovation and freedom. And and uh, so far, I guess the last year, I've just been kind of doing it as a hobby because I care about it. Hmm. Hopefully we can turn it into an actual career side side gig for my career. For sure. And you've rubbed shoulders with a lot of folks in D.C. You know, you mentioned Patrick McHenry. Um, I remember last time we spoke, you, you mentioned that you spoke to former SEC chair uh, Jay Clayton. And it, even in regards to the Ripple lawsuit, um, are you still in contact with him? Because, you know, it's funny that the juxtaposition of when he was in office and the actions he took versus what he's doing now. I find that so fascinating and interesting because he's now advising crypto companies. He's advocating for crypto regulation. So I'm like, well, where what happened when you were in office? Yeah, and, and I, I should say, I, I, I uh, if if I said this the, the last time I misspoke, we never talked about the Ripple lawsuit. We have talked about the SEC's approach to crypto. So we have okay. talked about that. And 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 we have different, very different perspectives on that. Um, yeah, look, uh, contrast where we are now with where we were then. Um, during the ICO era, 2017, I can understand how Clayton would be would look over the field of ICOs, right? Mm -hmm. And we have the benefit now of the projects that survived from that era, the legit projects that survived are great. And now are these great projects that have these whole communities around them, right? Sure. But those were the diamonds in the rough back then. And there was, in 2017, there was a lot of rough. There yeah. was a lot of junk. Yeah. And so he kind of looked over the field and didn't know probably much about the diamonds that have emerged from that, for, that had gone ICO, like Ethereum. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I, I get that it was difficult. Um, along the way, you know, the, the, the Hinman speeches that had become such a controversy in the Ripple litigation – Let's set that issue aside, and it's it's legitimate to talk about it, but let's set that aside for a second. The ideas in there were somewhat helpful, or at least relative to the lack of guidance we get from Gensler. There's some of that stuff in there that was helpful. I mean, the SEC admitted in there and in the the, the uh, framework guidance, they admitted that decentralization can be an antidote to the Howie test. Mm. Uh, that's not something that Gensler will admit, Yeah, um, but that's something they admitted, and that's helpful. Um, so no, I don't. Think, I don't think the Ripple case was the right thing to do. It was a bad case, and they should lose. And I hope they lose. Mm. Uh, just just on on basic principles of the Howey test, basic application of the Howey test. But um, you know, it was better than what we have now. It, sure. it, it, it always could get worse, and it has. And it's unfortunate. And hopefully, with time, we can we can fix that. For sure. Yeah, you brought up a great point that. I think Jay Clayton and the folks under under that you know administration were a bit more forward thinking with innovation uh, versus now it's kind of like enforcement enforcement it's like every month right and on that note uh, we, we saw the SEC go after Kim Kardashian and what seemed to be a PR stunt uh, the first thing as soon as it was tweeted out Gary went on TV and uh, there was all these well edited videos and so forth and. Folks were like, well, where was all this with Celsius Network and Voyager and Terra Luna? Kim Kardashian is the least of our problems with what's happening. That's right. It's incredible that um, so she did disclose that it was a paid advertisement yeah. in the Twitter posts or in the uh, well, social media post. It did say hashtag advertisement. Right. Mm -hmm. But the SEC rules say you have to disclose not only that it's an advertisement, uh, but also uh, that it's a uh, that the amount, the specific amount you are paid, which is pretty incredible. Um, and the only reason that Matt Damon didn't have to do that in his commercial for a crypto exchange was because it was about a crypto exchange and not about a particular token. Hmm. Um, 
the fact that she paid a million dollar penalty is unbelievable to me. And the only reason why is because she is Kim Kardashian. Uh, in a normal case like that, you you see a million dollar penalty for somebody who did something very, somebody who stole money. That's right. usually when you see a million dollar penalty. Somebody who lied to steal your money. The fact that Kim Kardashian paid a million dollar penalty because she didn't disclose, this is an advertisement, here's the exact amount I'm being paid, rather than what she did, which is disclose, this is an advertisement. Um, is incredible to me and and frankly an injustice not that she can't afford it but it, it is an injustice and then to compound it they went on a media tour to say look we got a reality star ta-da look at me uh, look at all the good i've done to protect investors um makes a joke of the agency and i don't like to see that yeah and, and there was a lot of criticism of this and I, sometimes i i, I I wonder maybe I my expectations are too high for government agencies, uh, you know, especially the likes of the SEC, where I'm like, where's the integrity? You know, where's the core value of protecting investors? This just seems like political stunts. Uh, and and look, there's reports of Chairman Genser, uh, folks are not happy with with what he did here and and how that went about, but who knows? Yeah, um, and you look, I'll say this too. You know, I I um not everything I do is advocacy based. Some of it is just real technical securities law stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so I hang around American Bar Association events with securities lawyers, people who worked at the SEC, who currently work at the SEC, who I'd probably describe as maybe Democrats who are very pro-regulation, right? Very pro-agency. And their view, everyone I talk to like that, their view is the same. We don't like what Gary's doing to the agency. He's politicizing this agency. And this is not what we do here. Mm-hmm. Uh so that's unfortunate. Um, and in just the other day, we, we have information and it, it, all the details haven't been revealed, but it seems the SEC is looking into NFT projects. Um, and we know Gary Gensler has also talked about potentially going after exchanges. We saw them block Coinbase lending. Uh, it seems like they're looking for low hanging fruit wherever they can. Um, you, you think we're going to see a ramp up in enforcements and, and going after things like which they haven't targeted before? The latest rumor I heard was that uh, Yuga Labs had received a request for information from the SEC. Um, that is something that a lot of crypto companies have received. It doesn't necessarily mean enforcement is coming. Uh, I think everybody's right to be concerned, but I wouldn't go to the point of being alarmed just mm-hmm. yet because it's still early in that. Um, but it, it, just even focusing on Yuga Labs, focusing on, on NFTs as maybe a security, um, I mean, come on, folks. It's monkey pictures, okay? Uh, <laughs> this is not this is not the Enron case, right? Uh, this is not where the SEC should be spending its time. Yeah, an example, and then like that even has me second guessing if I should launch an NFT collection. Like, I wanted to launch something for my community. It will have utility where they get special perks and so forth, and similar to what Starbucks is doing, right? You get the NFTs and you get exclusive access to things. So now I'm like, do I have to worry? Do I have to hire a lawyer? Do I have to? <laughs> yeah. In a way that you wouldn't worry if you were creating art and selling it at a gallery. Mm. Why should you have to worry just because you take that art and put it on chain and sell it digitally in exchange for in exchange for what? ETH, right? Mm. Which Gary also says is a security, which is a little weird because you're selling your art in exchange for ETH as the money that buys the art. Yeah. Um, so I think that in that way, if they're going after NFTs and the ETH used to pay for the NFTs, um, inherently contradictory. Yeah. And and on a note with Ethereum, um, they recently said that all transactions on the Ethereum blockchain fall under the jurisdiction of the SEC. And this was via the uh, crypto influencer Ian Bellina lawsuit, which is a separate issue in itself. Um but then, you know, it goes back to Bill Hinman gave a, a speech that Ethereum is not a security. Jay Clayton and Commissioner Jackson, those folks endorsed it. Now, all of a sudden, Gary Genser does not want to talk about Ethereum. He'll talk about Bitcoin, but Ethereum and all the other coins, we can't say anything. We can't tell you what's a security and what's not. I mean, it's kind of like madness. Like, I, I just, I sometimes it gets me so angry. Like, what is going on? Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. And and it's so... um. When we use the phrase regulation by enforcement, we have to be careful about what we mean because the head of the enforcement division of the SEC has countered that, what do you mean? There's no regulation by enforcement. We're just 
following the law, enforcing the law, right? Hmm. I want to be very specific about what regulation by enforcement means. It means bringing an enforcement action and putting a novel theory that's a real stretch for the agency into that enforcement action, knowing that the defendant is likely to settle and the matter will never actually be litigated by a court. And then putting that enforcement action up and saying that settlement and saying, you see, this is the law when it's not the law. It's not the law. That's exactly what they did in the Belinda matter. They said, you know what? We have jurisdiction over you, not merely because you're operating in the United States, which would have been enough to get jurisdiction over him and his activities uh, as an influencer. But they went a step further and said, and we also have it because, you know what? Everything on the Ethereum network happens in the United States, and therefore we have jurisdiction over it. They didn't have to say that. Mm. And therefore, no judge will ever rule on that. Because the judge will simply say, well, you know, because Mr. Bellina operated in the U.S., you have jurisdiction over him. So why did they say it in the first place? Because it's in a court filing and now they're going to point to it and say this is true when it's not true, when it's never been adjudicated before a court, it's never been determined by a judge. That's what regulation by enforcement is. And it delegitimizes, it, 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 it adds a certain illegitimacy to the agency itself. Yeah. And and on that note, you know, we mentioned adjudicate it hasn't been adjudicated with the Kim Kardashian situation. They also snuck in language there that implied Ethereum access to security without going through the due process. Yeah. Uh so it's just like these very sneaky uh trying yeah. to find all angles to put stuff out there, throw it at the wall and see if it sticks. Uh, that's right. And that's that's easy for an enforcement lawyer at the SEC to do. But when it's somebody's life and reputation and career at stake, uh, it can be very costly. Hmm. Um, on the note of the Ethereum speech with Bill Hinman, uh, I'm sure you're aware of all the con- controversy surrounding that. And there have been certain emails and notes released via FOIA uh, request done by uh, Empower Oversight, which is a nonprofit whistleblower organization. Look, I- I- we don't have all the details. The, the, what we see right now doesn't look great. What what do you think happened there? It, you know, with this Bill Hinman thing, but was there a conflict of interest? Any any thoughts that you can share there? Well, I only know what's been revealed through the FOIA requests. Uh, I think that party has done a great job. I think FOIA requests against the government are always appropriate, particularly given the Ripple litigation uh, and some of the hypocritical stances the SEC has taken in the Ripple litigation about the relevance of uh, the him and emails. Mm. Um, uh, look, I, 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 I'm not a believer yet in any kind of a grand conspiracy. I don't think I don't think folks at the Ethereum network did anything wrong. Um, I think it was a. Uh, it doesn't seem like he complied with the ethics guidelines. Sure. Uh, so the ethics rule was pretty clear. Don't uh, talk with your old firm where you continue to have a share in the firm's profits that t- treated as a retirement plan, right. but he didn't really retire. He went back to the firm after. So that ethics guidance was pretty important. It doesn't mean he broke the law, but it means that ethics guidance was very important. And his old firm was representing some folks in that community. I think the Ethereum Alliance, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, he should not have been having some of the communications that it seems that he did have. Uh, and so that's, that's unfortunate. I think. Yeah. And, and I think it- the SEC could have put this to bed already, but it seems they keep uh, trying to stall and not hand over certain dockets. So then it it that fosters people to speculate, well, they have something to hide. Right. So it just makes it into a worse situation because the public at large is seeing this and it's like, wait, what's going on here, right? There's some yeah, and here. That's right. And they've lost some credibility with Judge Network. We've already seen that. Yeah. I don't understand why. Yeah. Uh, it It's... It's mind blow. Uh, well, I should say it's puzzling. Um, so, it, with regards to the SEC Ripple lawsuit, um, what are your thoughts on the summary judgments, uh, the judges' orders, of course? And then we're seeing a lot of amicus briefs coming in from some uh, folks who are using different businesses are using XRP. Uh, we saw the, the Chamber of Digital Commerce file the amicus brief. Uh, what are your thoughts on the entire situation? Yeah, some great amicus uh, and some great arguments made by Ripple. Some really, really terrific lawyering. In that case, um, I, I think that uh, a couple of things here. 
First, just in app applying the Howey test, it doesn't apply to Ripple, right? It just doesn't work for a number of reasons. Um, XRP is used as currency, therefore it cannot be an investment of money. If it is money, uh, the level of decentralization in the network is pretty high. Uh, therefore, it doesn't meet the efforts of others test, horizontal or vertical commonality. Um, uh, and uh, it is more like a commodity than is, is a security, uh, like most of the rest of crypto. Um, so, and, and also, I think Ripple also makes a great argument that uh, if there's no actual contract, then you can't have an investment contract. Right. Um, using some analysis of the blue sky laws that predated the Howey test and kind of helped develop the Howey test. So there's a lot of great arguments in there. So let's just say first, just in applying standard Howey doctrine, I think the SEC loses. But even more than that, this doctrine is dynamic. It develops over time. Um, I think the U.S. Supreme Court would be hungry for an opportunity to take a fresh look at that doctrine. Mm. So even if Ripple loses, I think they have it. And I don't often say this. Usually I think when people say, well, I'm going to the Supreme Court, I say, ah, you lost. Time to quit. I don't say that this time. I say go all the way up because I think there are a number of things the Supreme Court could do with it. They could reinterpret elements of the Howey test in ways more consistent with the initial test in 1946, the initial case in 1946. Or they could apply something called the major questions doctrine, which they just used to uh, to to throw out a new EPA rule. The basic idea behind the major questions doctrine is, look, an agency can't take some um, uh, unclear kind of vague uh, regulation and use it to suddenly regulate a major part of the economy. You can't decide a major question of natural national policy using some obscure uh, provision in the regs that was written well before this new thing happened. Yeah. That's a that's a, an artful way of describing the major questions doctrine. Boy, it sounds like they're talking about crypto, doesn't it? Doesn't it sound like they're talking about Gary Ginsel's approach to crypto? Um, I like the chances of an argument like that. Even if it's just 10, 20 percent, that's a fighting chance to me. Let's take it. Let's go all the way. For sure. So just to uh, confirm, you know, the the process and, and the legislative process and so forth, it's essentially Congress that has to issue the mandate that the SEC needs to update the Howey test, or would it be a collaboration between Congress and the SEC to form a new Howey test or update it? Or you mentioned the Supreme Court. And, and that's why I just want to confirm, like, what would be the next steps, you know, in the ideal world to get this right? Uh, well, Congress could legislate. Mm -hmm. uh, they have not legislated y yet. And I think the odds are low that they will. Even the Stabenow-Bozeman bill mm -hmm. uh, that got some momentum at the two agriculture committees uh, just doesn't touch the Howey test at all. It just says if it's a security, it's a security, uh, which is one of the problems with the bill, right? It, it, it doesn't touch it and therefore leads a lot of uncertainty about what what other uh, tokens other than Ethereum and Bitcoin the bill will apply to, which is kind of uncertain because it just uh, links up with the uncertainty inherent in the Howey test itself. Um, so Congress could fix it. It probably won't. So it'll probably have to be the courts. Um, the phrase investment contract was put into a statute, uh, two statutes. And um, there was no, the statutes didn't say what an investment contract was. So the Supreme Court just said in 1946, well, let's think about what might have been in the minds of the drafters in 1933, 1934, when they put that phrase into the statute, investment contract. And what they said was, well, you know, this is something that blue so state securities regulations, so-called blue sky laws, um, have regulated in the 1900s, 1910s, 1920s. And so we can look at those to kind of interpret what investment contract means. And that's how they came up with the Howard test. Mm. So the Supreme Court can take a look and say, you know what? Lower courts have grown this doctrine out like a weed. And we're going to cut it back a little bit. Uh, and they could have an opportunity to do that. And I think they might. Mm. Um, boy, I hope that happens within the next two years and it doesn't go beyond that. And hopefully next year. Hopefully. Yeah, well, um, I hope it happens. Uh, if it happens in the next two years, it would be because the uh, the district judge does it. Um, if it's a SCOTUS fight, 
it'll take a long time. Take it'll mm -hmm. take five years, but um the other side of the aisle, the CFTC, uh, they recently did a enforcement action against a DAO. Um, what are your thoughts on that situation? And you know, could we start seeing enforcement actions for and look, and I, I want to back up and just state if there are scams and people who are doing bad activities, they should be taken down. The SEC, the CFTC, do your job. Yeah. But obviously not stifle innovation, not go after companies that are actually trying to do uh, great things. So what are your thoughts on the CFTC uh, going after the DAO? Yeah, they, they not only chose to charge the individual founders and for their activity pre-DAO, right? They didn't just do that. And they didn't just charge people very active in the DAO who are, are like core devs or something. They claim in their complaint that anyone who's voted on a governance matter for that DAO is jointly and severally liable for the whole fine, right? Anybody out there in the crypto world own any governance tokens and ever vote them in a DAO? Have you ever? Don't raise your hands. I, but I, I ask this question sometimes at events. I say, don't raise your hands, particularly because sometimes I'm, I'm at, in two yeah. weeks, I'm going to be at an event with the CFTC chairman. And I'm going to ask this question to the audience. I'm going to say, I, I probably need to remember, don't raise your hands, but just think inside your head. Have you ever? Okay, because the CFTC just said they might come after you and bring you into personal bankruptcy. So it's a little weird that you're all in the audience. And here we have the CFTC commissioners and chairman who just voted for something for which that is the implication. Um, I don't know, man. You know, I, you you always ask the question. Uh, I think you asked me last time, what what tokens do you hold? And I'm happy to talk about that. But, you know, after that case, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you about the governance tokens in DeFi protocols uh, anymore because, you know, you might be the next defendant. Right. Wow. Yeah. It's scary. That's, it's very scary. scary. Yeah. And I want to I want to give a shout out to the work at, that the Lex Punk Army is doing there. Mm -hmm. So they're the ones uh, combating this. It's hard for individual members of the DAO to jump in and say, oh, hey, here's uh, let me dox myself. Hold me liable. Right. Nobody's going to do that. Yeah. Uh, so Lex Punk Army has come in. They're a group of and they're properly described the Lex Punk Army, man. They are an army of very smart DeFi lawyers. Uh, and they've hired Steve Pally to represent them and uh uh he's filed motions and i think they're they're already having some success in pushing back on the procedural irregularities in the uki dow case and good for them and anybody in the audience wants to support lex punk army if you want to fight the good fight i hope you support my thing too yeah. the freedom lab but support lex punk army they're a, they're a, they're a um part of they're in the foxhole with us and they're already taking some shots so yeah, I'll be sure to include links in the description of the podcast and video and website so folks can go check uh, those out. Yeah. Um, final item here I want to ask you about, you know, despite all we just talked about and, you know, the challenges and so forth, we're just seeing the major financial institutions entering the crypto market. BlackRock, yeah, yeah. NASDAQ launched crypto custody, BNY Mellon this week launch crypto custody. Uh, Google will be accepting crypto payments via Coinbase for cloud their, their cloud services. Uh, and there's many more. Um, you know, what are your thoughts? Despite all these challenges, folks are still you know building and investing and innovating. Yeah, it's very hopeful. Um, I, on the one hand, I love it because it, it um, traditional institutions are going to be the pathway by which we get mass adoption, right? That's, that's a granted, that's a given. Yeah, I don't want TradFi to co-op crypto at the yeah. same time. Right. I want crypto to stay crypto, stay decentralized, stay a non, stay non KYC. Um, if I don't have the right now, some institutions like Coinbase or like whatever are going to be centralized KYC exchanges, and that's where most people get their crypto. That's fine. That's a big part of the future. But if I don't have the ability to go somewhere and get non KYC coins. What's the point? I mean, I just I, if if I lose that ability, I'm not interested in crypto anymore. I'm just not going to get involved. Mm. Uh, I don't think we will lose that because I think that um, if a DAO is or or if it, if a DEX is operated non DAO, uh, as long as people build the right way, then they can minimize those problems using the technology. Um, so yeah, excited. Also, want to keep crypto, you know, real and not have it turn into JP Morgan coin. 
yeah, uh, which is not the future and not anything that any of us should be interested in. Right. Um, uh, it, the the increasing adoption though also um, points to 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 the silliness of the SEC's refusal to approve a Bitcoin ETF, spot ETF. Uh, I mean, if Google's willing to take it as payments, uh, if they feel like it's safe, Bitcoin safe enough, then why can't we approve a, a spot ETF? Um, you know, uh, that's an important fight. Grayscale is bringing that fight. I hope they win. Yeah. Uh, and I think they got a good chance. Yeah, it's funny because uh, I think we may have spoken about it before. I, I had interviewed former SEC Commissioner Joseph Grunfest, who served under yeah. President Ronald Reagan. And I remember in the interview, he said these applicants of the Bitcoin spot ETF, they get denied, they can sue. And, and I'm actually waiting to see who else is going to throw the hat in the ring and sue the SEC over this as well from a yeah. Bitcoin spot ETF standpoint. Yeah, they should. That's should. That's a good suit. That's a good and and they've got uh, Davis Polk wrote uh, an initial letter, kind of outlining, "Hey, we're going to sue. Here's the arguments we're going to bring." And I'm surprised the SEC just said, "Yeah, go ahead, go ahead and do it." Uh, that seems to be their philosophy: is move fast and break things. And um, we're going to see how that works out. So, GW, I don't want to get conspiratorial, but we know that often incumbents will fight disruption and new technology and we know how the politics works with campaign donations and getting things done do you feel that there's a bit of uh like gold uh, gary genser you know being a goldman Ga goldman sachs guy you know he's he's kind of part of the incumbent legacy folks who are like you know let's slow this down so we can take a position and to your point you know traditional finance they're jumping in is, is that kind of what's happening here in the background not exactly. I, I think he came in with the approval and the backing of some very progressive members of the Senate who hate crypto and want to see it destroyed. And I think that's what motivates him uh, to a large degree. Uh, that's what's motivated the skepticism so far. Um, it works to the benefit of the big incumbent banks. And that's what's so unfortunate and why a lot of people in crypto kind of look at Senator Warren, Senator Brown and say, you hate big banks? Yeah, we hate big banks too. That's why we're doing all of this. That's the whole point is we hate big banks and don't trust big banks. So why are you defending them by attacking us? Hmm. Um, that's the kind of hypocrisy of that position, unfortunately. Yeah, well, uh, Gary Genser, Elizabeth Warren, Brad Sherman, three peds in a pod right there. <laughs> they just um, don't have an open mind and they're not willing to... to um, they're taking a position that ultimately helps entrench the big banks. Mm. And I think people don't talk about that enough. Um, but in a way, you know, with these folks like BlackRock coming into the market, will they start lobbying, um, you know, regulators and politicians to get it right with crypto, even those who are on the fence or are skeptics? I think that that, that might happen. Mm. Um, and I think it'll be, um, I think if people are willing to have that conversation, there's a lot of smart lawyers in crypto willing to meet them halfway mm -hmm. and already trying to meet them halfway, including lawyers like those at LexPunk that are uh, representing DeFi protocols. Um, if that's the conversation, I'd be glad to have it. we got to make sure that DeFi doesn't get thrown under the bus in that conversation. But as long as we can make sure that I'm willing to meet anybody halfway and talk about reasonable, responsible rules of the road, disclosures about tokenomics, disclosures about major holders, make sure there's no whale dumping, make sure there's audits of the secure, security audits of the smart contract code. All of that is good stuff and should be written in the rules. Uh, let's have that conversation rather than threatening every holder of a governance token and saying we might come after you. you know? hmm. uh, JW, always a pleasure. Thank you so much for the uh, information and the good fight that you're doing on behalf of the crypto industry. Good to talk with you, Tony. Keep up the podcast. I learned a lot from you too.